I had mentioned that um, generally a Q&A session is just a Q&A session, but I just want to introduce it with an idea um, that I think might some of you might find useful. <clears throat> it's based on the following verse. Let me just share a screen here so I can show you the verse. It's based on this verse over here. It's talking about the Israelites when they came to a place called Mara, M-A-R-A. -A. They came to a place called Mara. This was after the splitting of the sea and so on and so forth, all the tremendous miracles. They're wandering around in the desert now and they came to a place called Mara. <clears throat> and this is what the verse tells us. So they came to Mara. They couldn't drink water from this place called Mara. They couldn't drink the water there. <clears throat> because they were bitter. The literal sense of it is that the water was bitter. And therefore the place was called Mara because the waters were bitter. However, <clears throat> the Magadim is rich. The Magadim is rich was the successor to the Baal Shem Tov. He wasn't initially the successor, the son of the Baal Shem Tov, named Rip Tzvi, took over the mantle of leadership for a year. But on the day of the passing of his father, which was the day of Shavuot, the day of the giving of the Torah, uh, there was a meeting together of all the students and he got up and he took a cloak off and he put the cloak of the mantle of leadership on the Magadim is rich, and he said, that's what my father wanted. And anyway, in any event, the Magadim is rich became the leader after the Baal Shem Tov, the leader of all the Hasidim, <coughs> and he expanded the um, Hasidism to a tremendous extent, and uh, very successfully as well. In any event, he uh, reinterprets this verse, and he says, Maras, they came to the place called Mara, and they couldn't drink the water, not because the water was bitter, but because they were bitter. They were bitter, <clears throat> meaning to say that the bitterness that a person has inside, he often projects onto his situation. So the bitterness that they had inside, whatever the bitterness was uh, caused by, it doesn't matter right now, but that bitterness that they had inside was projected, so to speak, outwards, and therefore the water tasted bitter to them. You probably know people like this when people are bitter, when people are upset and everything, everything... Uh, you know, everything stinks. No, nothing's good. Even the coffee doesn't taste good, if you know what I mean, a fresh cup of coffee. <clears throat> so they were marim, they were bitter, and therefore they saw everything else as being kind of tainted. So the, um, the question is what to do about such a situation when a person is in a state of bitterness like this, what do you do? So the answer is actually given in two different places. <clears throat> One answer is given in the Zohar, the Zohar, the classic fundamental text of Kabbalah, the Zohar, <clears throat> and the Zohar says um, that Moses was shown afterwards, he was, after, after the, uh, they couldn't drink the water, he was shown a tree, a branch of which he had to throw into the water, he had to cast into the water. So the, um, the Zohar says, what was that tree? That tree was the Eitz HaChaim, the tree of life. What's the tree of life? The tree of life is the inner dimension of the Torah. In other words, what was making them embittered, <coughs> according to the Zohar, was the external form of the commands that they had been given because they didn't <coughs> understand the, in, the inner dimension of these things. And therefore, the way to get them out of their bitterness, says the Zohar, was to teach them to cast into them, to cast into the waters, into the waters of Torah, Torah is always compared to water, to cast into the waters of the Torah, the tree of life. In other words, that the tree of life would now sweeten up the waters. And that's in fact, what um, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu did subsequently. But there's another explanation and that's the explanation of the Midrash. <clears throat> the Midrash says that um, when, Mo when Moses was told to throw a, this piece of wood or branch of a tree into the water, the Midrash says that this was a tree of very, very bitter wood, something like wormwood, or it's called hidofni, which is usually translated as willow, but in this particular case, it was some, probably some other kind of wood, <clears throat> some kind of shrub, and very, very bitter. So the Midrash explains that with bitter and bitter, Negative and negative makes positive. Bitter sweetens bitter. But what does that mean, practically speaking? That means that in order to sweeten up a person's bitterness, so they have to be bitter about being bitter. In other words, in order to get rid of the bitterness, be bitter about it. 
um, why, and uh, the, um, uh, the Talmud expresses in a couple of places this idea that a person should always make his good, inclina good inclination, his godly inclination, angry against his evil inclination. Always a person should make his good inclination angry at his evil inclination, or let's call it the inclination to evil rather than the evil inclination. It has a purpose, it's not evil in and of itself. <clears throat> it just inclines us towards doing the wrong thing. So in order to get out of that, in order to remove ourselves from that, so we have to sweeten it up. The way to sweeten it out is, that, is to be bitter about being bitter. And that um, will change the whole attitude and the whole uh, approach. Okay, so having said that, um, I am now going to address, that's just a, a little uh, idea for you guys to, um, to see. Um, and now I'm going to discuss some of the questions. So there's a question from Ellen, and she says like this, they, there's two quotes from Talmudic sources that says like this, a man breaks off, what Rabbi Levi said, a man who breaks off the study of the Torah to engage in idle talk will be made to eat cinders of the broom tree. <clears throat> and another quote, Rabbi Shimon, Simeon, Rabbi Shimon, that's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, he who while walking on a road is repeating aloud what he learned, but then interrupts interrupt himself to say, how beautiful is this tree, how beautiful is the newly plowed field. Scripture regards it as if he had incurred guilt expiable only by his life. In other words, he occurs the death penalty, so to speak. Now, what is the meaning? Uh, Alan wants to know what is the meaning of this? <clears throat> Don't get hung up on the, what the broom tree is. It's true that the Talmud says that the broom tree cinders, the, the, um, the burning embers of the broom tree burn for a very long time and they burn very hot, which is why they're often used, uh, they were often used in smelting metals and things like that. But in any event, don't concern yourself with that. The idea is as follows. There are two sources of beauty, you could say. One is the world in which we live. It's a beautiful world, it's a world created by God. And it has its beauty. But nevertheless, the world was created through the name Elohim, through the name which um, hints at or suggests the concept of multiplicity and diversity and so on and so forth. The name Elohim is the, one of the, it's the only name really in the plural, the only divine name in the plural. And you see in the right throughout the beginning of creation, 32 times that name Elohim is mentioned. That's the 32 paths of wisdom, etc. But nevertheless, in all of the, <coughs> in all of creation, creation starts off with Bereshit bar Elohim. In the beginning, God and the name Elohim is used for God over there, created. So in other words, the creation, the whole process of creation, or the creation of the world, not just our world, but all of the world, is a process of concealment. Godliness, which is infinite, has to be concealed in order to create a finite world. It's concealed to a greater extent in the lower worlds and to a less extent in the higher worlds but even in the higher worlds there's a concealment of godliness so when a person is, a, is is involved in studying torah he's studying torah and torah is the revelation of the ineffable name which we spoke about yesterday yud Vavke, the name havaya in other words the ineffable infinite name that expresses the infinite quality of godliness prep that that it always was always uh, is and always will be that's the name of Vaya, past present and future I hope every year that infinite dimension is what the Torah is all about that infinite dimension so if a person is studying the infinite dimension of things and he's, even he's walking on the road and he stops to admire a much lesser form of beauty in other words, the beauty of the world, which comes about through the name Elohim, that is the um, um, that is the opposite of what a person really should be doing. And therefore, it's as if, not literally, but it's as if <clears throat> he will be made to eat dust or 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 embers of the broom tree or whatever it is don't worry about what kind of tree it is in other words he's going to have to eat coal uh, you know it's only an expression it's not meant literally or he will have uh, incurred liability to his life 
<clears throat> he'd be liable for his life. It's not again meant literally a person is not going to be killed for such a thing, but um, the life, the eternal life, the life of the spirit, the life of um, of which which derives from the name Havaya, from the ineffable name, is of a much higher quality than the life of the world. And that's why it is um, considered um, an, an injustice, or if you want to use the term a sin, it's a transgression of doing what you're supposed to do. I hope that answered that question. Okay, Justin has a number of questions, a number of different verses. Justin, I'm not going to be able to go through all the verses here because I'm not sure that everyone would be interested. Your basic question was, why does the why do verses sometimes use very similar expressions <clears throat> to express itself as if it's just being repetitive? And uh, you noted that I mentioned in a previous class that these words are not repetitive. Um, they, uh, the part of the problem is the English translation. A lot of the time, the people who are doing the translation think more about the translation than they, have, than they actually think about what the meaning of the text actually is. And therefore, they translate the words, but they don't translate the meaning. They don't translate the inner essence of what's been spoken about. I will give you one example. Um, here, let me share screen again. I will show you one of the verses which you asked about, which is this one here. I'm assuming you can all see this now. This, uh, this verse here in Isaiah 31, war rebellious children says, God, you make plans against my will and scheme against my wishes. So he had uh, this uh, question, why does it be plans against my will and scheme against my wishes? Seems to be the same thing. But in the Hebrew, if you look at the Hebrew, the two different Hebrew words are used. The word Eitzah is um, against my, well, they translate it as against my will. It's not correct. It's against my advice, right? It's against my advice. And Veloruhi is against my spirit. So what the, the, the prophet is pointing out of here, there's two things. There's two things that have been done here. There's two things that the rebellious children, in other words, children of Israel, one of, the, one of the things that they did is they didn't follow God's advice. In other words, direct advice, things that make sense, even logically, right? Advice makes sense logically. It's not you're just told to do something. It makes sense to you. And nevertheless, they didn't follow the logical pattern, the logical path, which was required by this advice, which was revealed advice, revealed and logical and understood and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and furthermore, in other instances, they went against the spirit of the law, not maybe the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, the spirit. The law, ruhi, ruhi means my spirit. He translates here and scheme against my wishes. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't translate it properly. It's not the, uh, this is not the, um, the, the meaning of it. It's two different kinds of, um, uh, two different things are being highlighted here. On the one, logical advice, and the other, the spirit of the matter, right? The the um, the overarching uh, inner dimensional spirit of something, and therefore, um, if you know the Hebrew, you'll see that these um, <clears throat> that these are um, actually very different, very different terms. <clears throat> Elimelech has the following question. I see there was actually a couple of questions over there. One second, there was something in the chat. Did I miss it? um chat uh, okay i'll get to that um i'll get to these questions soon i'll get to the questions soon yeah those questions on the chat uh elimelech asks a question according to kabbalah is there a proper disposal of a hair that has been cut or gathered in a comb or brush you're allowed to flush it down the toilet but I like burying it like fingernails etc etc that was the first question okay this is a somewhat of an esoteric question it's really a kabbalistic question <clears throat> we have to make a distinction here between the hair of the head and the hair of the beard or the hair of the peyote, the peyote, the side locks. Uh, in our tradition, in the tradition of Lubavitch, on the Lubavitcher, Chabad, <clears throat> we don't grow our side locks very long like some do, you know, and twirl them and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, the side locks and the beard are considered holy, right? Because there's commands about them in, uh, in the Torah, not to touch the beard and so on and so forth, not to cut it. <clears throat> and that's taken literally in the... Um, in Kabbalah that you don't cut your beard. So what happens is if you go to the barber for a haircut, you can throw that hair away, it's no problem. If a beard hair falls out or um, the payers, hair from the payers fall out, then it is proper to bury them, yes. Bury them usually with books. Um, 
there are some people, some of my teachers included, who uh, when a hair falls out, they put it in a book. But um, um, there are some people that don't like doing that, um, putting in a holy book in case someone else opens it up and they'll be sort of turned off by finding hair growing in a book, so to speak. Um, so yes, it should be um, disposed of in a, <clears throat> let's call it in, a, in an honorable manner rather than just throwing it in the garbage or flushing it down the toilet because the hair of the beard is holy. The hair of the beard is the 13 tikkune dikna, the 13 rectifications of the beard. There's certain points in the beard which are called the rectifications of the beard and the peyote also are um, are holy. Uh, I don't want to go into the whole thing now, but um, that is the situation. All right, the second question that Elimelech asked was the changing of Midot. In order to change your emotional qualities, the Midot, <coughs> Tikkun and alleviating our past sins. How do you do the Tikkun? How do you rectify things? How do you change yourself? Is it only by reading of daily Torah, executing the mitzvahs, giving weekly charity, executing the mitzvahs means fulfilling the commandments, giving weekly charity and prayer and personal sincerity with God. As outlined in a few places, he gives uh, some references. Yes, that is certainly one of the approaches that we take. There's uh, multifaceted approaches, but those approaches that you mentioned are for sure part of the picture. <clears throat> there is also a concept of self-assessment, which is important. A person has to think about themselves and where they're holding and what they're all about and uh, and consequently be able to um, find a way to do things in a um, <clears throat> sort of step out of their boundaries step out of the boundaries of, of of their past their past life and their past habits and so on step out of the boundaries of habit which is not necessarily an easy thing but nevertheless that's what we have to do of course adding in Torah and study of Torah and doing the commandments and so on is clearly uh, a tremendous help. But one has to make an assessment of where you're holding and what you're doing and what's going wrong and so on and so forth and why. <clears throat> so hopefully that answers that question. Um, uh, Miriam asked if this behavior applies for women too, in other words, being bitter about being bitter. Yes, it applies for women too. But again, the being bitter doesn't mean being depressed. Bitterness and depression are two very different things. Bitterness has energy to it. Depression is when you lack energy. It's completely a lack of energy. You throw up your hands in despair. That's what um, uh, that's what depression is all about. But 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 bitterness is I'm going to do something about it, right? I'm going to do something about it. It's important to realize that I'm bitter and certain things are causing me bitter, and I've had enough of this bitterness. And I'm going to change my life around. I'm going to change things around and forget the bitterness and start looking at the good things and bringing out the good in everything that I can. And that's the way um, one should approach um, that uh, particular issue. That stuff says, Alan, yeah, it's tough to a certain extent, but, um, but nevertheless, it's effective. Uh, <clears throat> what's the spiritual significance of water and what is the capitalistic interpretation of fire in high world? And lower worlds. We need water to survive in the body. Water is used for cleansing the mikveh, purifying and cleansing. Fire is used to heat the cold and cook food and also to destroy like a forest fire. Yeah. Um, what I know you asked me this question once and I said I would actually address it in a class. I didn't actually get there. I didn't get to it yet. But um, water and fire are basically the spherot of chesed and gvura. Chesed is the outpouring of like water. You pour out chesed and therefore water represents kindness, especially in we're talking about a people who went through the desert for 40 years and they knew the meaning of water and the necessity of water and so on and so forth. And in general, the Middle East is a pretty dry, um, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly dry region, uh, certainly compared with um, most states in America. <clears throat> so water is the concept of chesed. It's a concept of kindness. Offering a person water is an expression of kindness. <coughs> As we um, as we see in many uh, in many cases, for example, when Rivka um, who was married to um, I'm sorry, not Rivka, uh, Rachel, when when Rachel, um, who eventually married Jacob, she brought water for his sheep and for him. Uh, 
she watered his sheep and she brought him water to drink. It's an act of kindness. She's a very kind person. And that's why they were a perfect match. Um, fire represents the concept of Gvura. <clears throat> water brings things together. When you pour water into flour, let's say, then the flour starts to cohese together and becomes a dough, right? But when you add fire to something, fire causes things to crumble and to fall apart. So the idea of fire is Gvura, that's division, divides things into their various components and into smaller and smaller parts. So both of these work together. Fire and water have to work together. Like when you have a cup of coffee, you want a hot cup of coffee, I assume anyway, most of you. <clears throat> Unless you live in Florida, maybe you drink cold coffee. But um, in any event, um, water and fire need to be um, balanced one with the other. So it's not all one and not all the other. Over kindness is not kindness anymore, it's cruelty. <clears throat> being overly kind to certain people is actually maybe being cruel to others or even being cruel, cruel to the people themselves. Those people themselves, if you know from uh, child's education, what a child needs is a structure and he needs a certain amount of discipline. If there's no discipline and no structure, which is from Gvura in a child's life and it's only kindness, very often that child will turn out to be a completely spoiled brat because they don't know any limitations. They don't know boundaries. They have no idea of what proper boundaries are. So therefore you have to have boundaries together with kindness. Again, just boundaries without kindness is also absolutely uh, not gonna work. Just harshness, and unfortunately we see many cases of this recently in the newspapers of little children being beaten severely by parents to the extent that you know they, they passed on, that the children died. I mean, there was a number of cases recently, just really, really tragic, terrible cases. But in any event, um, gvura, harshness, without mitigating it with kindness, without the two being mixed together, is also not beneficial to anybody. So we have to have the two things together. And that is that representation of the two things together is actually the sphira, that's in the sphira of Tiferet. Tiferet combines chesed and gvura in a, uh, in a compassionate way. It's compassion. That's the, the, the Tiferet is really compared, kind of, kind of translated as beauty, but it really, the inner dimension of that means compassion. It's a it's compassion, which includes chesed and gvura. It includes kindness and boundaries. That's what compassion is. Um, yes, a child doesn't recognize evil if raised without. Really can... Uh, F up, yes. <laughs> a good start, yes. Um, yeah, that's true. But evil, I think we have to be careful of. Um, you know, let's let's not try and introduce evil into our children's lives, but rather discipline and boundaries. Child has to know, you know, you can't give him cake all the time, you know, he has to have uh, proper food. <clears throat> And there have to be times to go to sleep and there have to be times to wake up and there have to be times to bath and so on and so forth. And then, you know, the child needs structure and they need discipline, uh, as well as love, obviously. Sorry about that. Let me just... Uh... Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, folks? Um, okay. <coughs> Did I miss any? Uh, yes, <laughs> there you go. Um, Leia Ruby, I did not see your email. No, uh, let me see if I can pull it up now. Um, I looked last a few hours before the class, I'll admit. Um, so let me see if I can just pull up your email right now. And oh, here we go. Um, yeah, you sent it, you didn't send it to Kabbalah, dec Kabbalah decoded, that's why I didn't see it. Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, one of the questions is about astrology and hypnotherapy as maybe out there 
um, astrology is out there of the wrong sort. There's astrology that's brought in Sefer Yetzirah. And there is astrology, but it's not the astrology that it's, it's more sort of astronomy than astrology. Sorry about this, folks. I keep on calling. Uh, you know, this is the time they're starting to try and raise money for politicians, which um, <clears throat> in any event, uh, astrology is, you know, the astrology that you get in various books, uh, in various, uh, in various, let's call them, uh, I don't want to say cults necessarily, but tending in that direction. Uh, astrology cults are, um, they miss the mark completely, really. Um, no problem, Andrea. Um, but hypnotherapy, no. I think hypnotherapy has a place if it's done properly. Um, it is, in fact, I studied hypnotherapy, uh, the Milton Erickson branch of hypnotherapy primar primarily. And hypnotherapy can be a very useful way of dealing with problems that otherwise do not have easy solutions. It's a, it cuts through a lot of the, uh, I don't know if I should say this in public, but it cuts through a lot of the crap um, in order to get to, um, in order to get to the truth <clears throat> and in order to get to a solution. It's solution-focused hypno hypnotherapy. That's uh, Milton Erickson, who's a famous proponent and uh, founder of that approach, solution-approached <clears throat> therapy in general and hypnotherapy as well. Um, psychological and energetics tool to be with potential unconscious themes, energies. Um, you have to be very careful because there's a tremendous amount of misinformation and disinformation when it comes to these kinds of things. I'm not saying that um, they're necessarily incorrect. I'm sure that there's some <clears throat> that are <coughs> <coughs> that are correct and have, have some truths, but I would be I would be hesitant. I would be careful because <coughs> there are many people who um, sell what they call truths as, uh, as truth, and very often they're pretty wide of the mark. There are certain uh, Kabbalists who use these methodologies, <clears throat> but obviously that methodology is grounded in Kabbalah and grounded in the Torah. And uh, so I don't wanna make a blanket statement against them, but one has to be very, very careful and know what you're doing. You have to be aware of what um, <clears throat> of what can be used and what can't, and how to use it. Um, Carl Jung used his principle of psychological astrology in his work with patients as a psychotherapist. I did not know that. Uh, Rabbi Kin, astrology calls it Jewish astrology. Yeah, there's Rabbi Glazer, and Rabbi Kin, various others, yeah. Um, which planets correspond to which of the spherot. Um, well, there's 10 of them and I, I'd, ha I'd have to, um, I have to look at it again to, to be absolutely, um, before, before I say it in public, I, I wanna be sure Malchut is always, um, is always the moon, but, um, yeah, I can, uh, I can probably send you a chart of that. <clears throat> Just remind me if you don't mind. Um, yeah, some of it is taken from Safi Tira and um, <clears throat> a lot of it is taken from Safi Tira. The truth is a lot of astrology is taken from Safi Tira as well. Just that it became corrupted and um, unfortunately, <clears throat> in some cases, unrecognizable. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, that looks like the questions. Yeah. Um, looks like there was another question as well before. I didn't see that one. Um, okay. <clears throat> um, there's a first question number two about praying in English. Yeah, I didn't see that question. Uh, yes, one can pray in English. 
it is obviously better once you've learned Hebrew to pray in Hebrew if it's possible, but for those people who can't pray in Hebrew for whatever reason, uh, that don't speak Hebrew or whatever it is, uh, you can pray in English. God understands all languages. <laughs> it has to come from the heart. That's the most uh, important thing. Yes, it's true that there's certain nuances in the Hebrew prayers which uh, don't come out in English, but um, nevertheless, praying in English is fine as long as one prays from the heart in any language. Whatever language you pray, pray in, you have to pray from the heart, not from the mouth. And that is, um, that's the main thing. So you can pray in any language you want, um, including English, <clears throat> when you pray from the heart. And that takes some practice. Uh, if appropriate, BB teaches that we aren't even on the level of Malchut. What does that mean? Uh, I don't follow B'nai Baruch um, for various reasons. I believe that they've corrupted the teachings um, uh, and they've gone off uh, on their own track. Um, and this is my personal belief. I'm not making a statement about anybody's um, <clears throat> allegiances and so on and so forth, but I do not follow B'nai Baruch at all. I don't believe that they're on the right track. <clears throat> um, so they teach that we're not on the level of Malchut uh, it depends on what we're talking about are we talking about the world in general are we talking about and which Malchut are we talking about are we talking about Malchut of the lowest world of Atzilut uh, of, of Bria, of Yitzira, of, of Asiya where, where are we talking about <clears throat> that's a very general statement um, so I don't really know if that is um, even an appropriate comment to discuss because um, I don't believe that we're just on the level of Malchut, uh, different people on different levels. And if you're talking about the nation as a whole or uh, various other things, I don't know, it's very unspecific, that question. So it's really hard to analyze it. <clears throat> um, the truth is that the soul is part of God above and therefore, you know, we transcend all of the three roads essentially. In the essence of the soul. The essence of the soul transcends all of the spirit. <clears throat> the spirit is just a, um, a manifestation of various powers of the soul, but the soul itself transcends all of the spirit. So, what is the best source of the stories of the Baal Shem Tov? There are a number of different books in English. There are many more Hebrew books, obviously, but there are a number of books in English. I think they're just called Stories of the Baal Shem Tov. I think if you will look online, um, if you look online, you will find uh, a number of different um, books, stories of the Baal Shem Tov. And um, I'm trying to think of a title of one. Um, let me just quickly go to Amazon and see if I can find anything. In Hebrew, that's not going to help. Okay. Um, just go onto Amazon and look. Shem Tov stories. Yeah, here we go. Uh, there's one called Faith, Love, and Joy. Well, Shem Tov stories. <clears throat> stories of the legend of Kabbalah Master in praise of the Baal Shem Tov. Yes, that is. Uh, in praise of the Baal Shem Tov, but don't get the one that's online on Amazon because they're charging $98 for it. You can probably get it. Um, <laughs> you could probably get it for about 10 bucks. <clears throat> mystical stories in the weekly parsha, Baal Shem Tov, numbers, mystical story in the weekly parsha. That seems to be good too. Um, the life and story of the Baal Shem Tov, Eliyahu Friedman. Yes, that, that I would recommend. Stories of Baal Shem Tov, Kulim Pasha, There's plenty of books. Plenty, plenty, plenty. I wouldn't really get the one from Isaac by Sheva Singer, because those are sort of, uh, you know, dramatized, and they're not really, I don't think they're... Uh, um, in praise of Baal Shem Tov, yeah, 12 bucks. There you go. That's a better price. Um, Seeker of Slumbering Souls, Stories of the Baal Shem Tov. There seem to be quite a few choices. So uh, that's what I would suggest you do. <clears throat> go to, oops, go to um, Amazon.com. Any other questions, folks?
All right, seems that there's no more questions. We'll stop here and um, see you next week, hopefully. All righty. All right, all the best. Have a good time, everybody. Yep. Good. Uh, Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Leah, if you want to get hold of me, uh, write to Kabbalah Decoded um, or, or the other email, it's okay. But uh, if you have specific questions, let me know and I'll try and answer you. All righty. Thank you, Wendy. All the best, everybody. And Lala Tov. We'll, we'll see you, Lala Tov.